Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week that wasn't promised, that you are blessed, that you are healthy, that you are in the next level of your relationship with God. That's the whole point. I pray from week to week that you grow to a new level in your relationship with Him because that is always the goal. We forget what the end goal looks like. You know, we think the end goal is heaven. No, the end goal is to be more like Christ. That's the end goal. That has always been the end goal. Heaven is the byproduct. Do y'all get that? You know, and, and, and I got to share as we are, we're going to be back in Philippians again th- to, today. Um, and I think the last couple of messages may have come out of Philippians as well. And, and here's what I'm finding that in this, we're, we're talking about with, with Paul. He's writing this beautiful book of joy to everyone. And he is, the last couple of messages, one dealt with that, you know, God was not impressed. Things that didn't impress God, right? And so that kind of dealt with all the things that we as humans are very proud of. And God goes, means nothing to me, right? And so as I was going through preparing this message here for this week, it resonated in me and it clicked in my little feeble little brain. Whenever I would read that when, he, when Paul said, I counted these things as lost, when he says that I was of the nation of, of Israel, right? Do you know what he was talking about? He was talking about like us when we say, I'm an American. I'm an American Christian, right? God doesn't care that I'm an American. What he cares about is that I'm Christian. I have no more position or title as being an American Christian than I would if I was in Ethiopia as a Christian. You see, we think Ethiopian, third world, those kind of things, right? America here. God don't care where you are as a, as a country. He cares where you are as a Christian in your walk with him. That has been the key piece. And I was like, oh my God, he just hit me in the forehead. He doesn't care that I'm American. But we put so much emphasis on that part. Well, you know, I'm an American. Mm. You know, he says in Matthew 6, 33, first seek you the kingdom of God and all this righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The first thing he wants you to be proud of, you're going to boast in anything. I'm a Christian. Then I'm an American. I'm a Christian American. How about that one? Do y'all get it? Because see, when, when Paul was throwing all these things in the trash can, he threw away, when you say Pharisees, the Pharisees was kind of like the political party. Pharisees and Sadducees, Sanhedrin, right? He threw away his political party. You get it? He threw it and he counted it as dung. I'm a Pharisee, trash. Because when he was a Pharisee, he was somebody. He, was, he got to sit at the feet of Gamaliel, the preeminent teacher of the law. He got to be at the, at one of the best. He wasn't even a Sadducee. He was a Pharisee which was even a little higher than the Sadducee, right? So he, he had all these things that he was proud of, and he just threw them all away because they didn't, they didn't impress God. But they impressed man. Do y'all get that? They impressed man. And so as, we, as you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, starting at the 8th verse, say amen when you have it, if not, so it on me. Amen. amen? Philippians chapter 3, starting at the 8th verse. It's, this, this is beautiful. I hope it blesses you as much as it did me. Listen to what it says. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Verse nine, it may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own deprived, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be you and your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hours come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to, to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to you fill me afresh in you with your Holy Spirit and that you bless me to be able to write the divide to where the truth before us. And Father God, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer and we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. And amen. This morning's sermon title is called Losing to Gain. Losing to Gain. At the top of your outline, you'll find this beautiful word, gain. 
It says gain is an increase in value seen as a profit. It is the opposite of loss. And it's kind of an odd concept, don't you think? Losing to gain. Right? Because normally you lose, you don't feel like you gain anything. Right? But you see, I just want to welcome you once again this morning. Let's get this kicked off real good. The last two messages have been so rich with God's precepts and principles. Amen? Amen. And so I want to just step back just for a moment to verse 7 and use it to escort us into this morning's message. Verse 7 says this, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul is saying, I have sold out all that I am to know Christ. Do y'all get that? He had some things. So it wasn't like he didn't have anything. He had some stuff that most people would have killed to try to have. Right? His pedigree was rich. But you see, Paul is telling the Philippians this morning, Jesus Christ alone is the only way to salvation. There's nothing that we can add to ourselves personally, humanistically, that can earn us or gain us favor or salvation with God. So if we look at verse 8 this morning, Paul does his, what I call, spiritual math, right? Showing us how he turns a loss into a gain. And here's the thing. There was seven religious credentials or human achievements that Paul had counted at one point as a gain in his life. And there were these things. Circumcised on the eighth day, being of the nation of Israel, being a born of the tribe of, uh, of, the tribe of Benjamin, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Concerning the law, he was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. Concerning righteousness in the law, he was blameless. Do you understand? When he, I got to take this for a moment. When he said he was Hebrew of Hebrews, do you know that he was like pride in his nationality above anyone else? I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, so I get to look down upon you. He gave all that up because there was none of that impressed God. Do y'all get it? I'm just trying to make it really plain because see, we, we, we attach a lot of things to us to make man look at us right differently or at a next level, but we don't care about how God looks at us. You see, Paul was talking about losing to gain. And so he's going to, this was seven things that he had considered as gain in the early part of his life before he come to know Christ. And he's going to trade them off for five things in Christ. So he's going to give up seven to get five. Did I get that? You see, because these were the credentials and works that Paul had planned to use to earn and buy his salvation from God. But when we look at verse 8, he moves all these credentials and works into the lost column. See, I want you to see that Paul chose to lose seven this morning to just so he could gain five in Christ. And, and in your outline, you will see that there's numbers one through five beside the beginning of a word. So these numbers represent the five benefits Paul received in Christ from an intimate, personal relationship with him. You get that? It's an intimate, personal relationship. See, it's not enough just to have knowledge. Okay? There has to be the relationship. The relationship has to be healthy and intact. So if you look with me at verse 8, listen to this. It says this. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value. Paul tells the Philippians that not only did I count the seven religious credentials and human achievements as a loss, but I count all things as a loss. But you got to ask yourself, why did Paul count all things as a loss? Here's why. For the surpassing value of knowing Christ. You see, he got rid of all the things that would have hindered him from truly entering to this deep, knowing relationship, loving relationship with God. He got rid of all of those things. See, that's the ultimate, dying to self. Do y'all realize that, right? That when you give up, so we, you know, when you give up something, we feel, especially if you say you gave it up for God. You know, I gave this up for God, right? But it's something, not all things. I'll share with you that when I didn't want to be in the ministry, wasn't my, I saw my father go through it, not something Patrick wanted. So I added a whole bunch of extra junk to me, thinking that if I had all this extra junk, I can't go into the ministry. 
But God in his infinite wisdom will not allow you to make a liar out of him. He will strip those things away from you. And then when he started to take those things away, people on the outside looking at me saw, thought these things that like, wow, this dude's got to be really suffering. He's got to be lonely. He's got to be all... When he stripped all those things away, it allowed me to have the best relationship I could possibly have. I got one of the greatest educations. I got one of the most greatest love stories in my life written on me in his word because I truly started to understand what he meant when he says that I love you. And, I, and he goes, because I was like, well, God, you can't use me because I did this, da, da, da. He goes, you don't understand, but I love you. I loved you before you were hidden behind your mama's navel. I called you to be what you're going to be before you were even a thought for your parents. See, this is when you start to truly understand that. And so when I gave up a lot of things to know God the way he wanted me to know him, it helped me grow in such a way in a short period of time. My grandma used to tell me, you got an old soul, boy. No, what I had was a soul that knew the Lord. Come on now. And so in knowing the Lord that way, when he removed these things, when you give up stuff that you don't replace it with other junk. No, we give up something, we replace it with something else in the world. God says, you give this up and you put me where I'm supposed to be in your life. And then he says, then you can add all these other things unto you. We always get it wrong. We add everything else and then try to add God at the bottom. So, but this wasn't Paul. By the way, when he says that word surpassing value in the Greek, it means that it has an incomparable worth. There was nothing that could compare to the worth of knowing Christ. Nothing. And so Jesus gives, gave uh, two greater parables about the great value of heaven as well. If you look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Then if you look further down, here's the second one. Matthew 13, verse 45 to 46, he says again, the king of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Verse 46, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, I want you to realize something. Both of these merchants in the parable showed to have wealth before, right? But found that their wealth failed greatly in comparison to heaven. Their wealth wasn't enough, so they sold everything that they had so they could obtain what? Heaven. See, this is Paul's testimony this morning. He was losing to gain. Somebody say something. But let's look at verse 8b. Paul tells us the first benefit in the gain column was to know Christ. He says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so Paul is not talking about head knowledge, but he's talking about head knowledge. Somebody say something, see. He's talking about a personal relationship which creates a saving and eternal life. Even Jesus spoke about us knowing him and him knowing us. If you look at John chapter 10, verse 14, it says this. I am the good shepherd and I know my and I'm I know my own and my own knows me. Isn't that beautiful? He says, I'm the good shepherd and I know mine and my my own knows me. That's personal. And so the Apostle John wrote about knowing Christ in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? Come on now. See, I'm talking about losing the game this morning. So Paul adds personal warmth to, to knowing Christ by the way he addressed him. You understand? Paul doesn't just say words just to say words. When he says this, when Paul said, Christ Jesus, my Lord, it meant something to him. He was hitting on all the major points. There was three major points in that piece, by the way. This threefold description encompasses Christ's three offices as Messiah, priest, and and king. Somebody need to say something. Christ deals with the views him as the Messiah, the messenger of God. Jesus views him from a, as a savior, emphasizing his role as the believer's great high priest and Lord views him as a sovereign king over all the creation. Somebody need to say something. That's how he sees it. That's the relationship he has. Isn't that beautiful? He gave up all of his human stuff, credentials and achievements, so he would know this above all things. Mm. You see, salvation comes only through 
the deep knowledge of in an intimate love bond with Jesus Christ. That's it. And you realize that God gives this to us by grace through faith. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by the way. And so let's look at verse 8c. And Paul tells us that he suffered in dying to self. This is my favorite, by the way. I got to tell you, okay? He says, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And what I love about it is that Paul is keeping it real. And today's uh, 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 nomenclature, Paul's been keeping it 100. Okay? He's keeping it 100. He tells us that we will experience some suffering when we die to self. When you start to separate those things of the world from you, he says you're going to feel some suffering in it. And see, our flesh doesn't want to let go of the worldly things. Paul has some of the greatest religious credentials and human achievements that most men could only dream about having. And so he's telling you, I felt the suffering. I felt the pain of it going away. But it wasn't enough to hold on to him. The value of knowing Christ was greater. Isn't that beautiful? You see, that's what I'm loving about this. You see, for our religious credentials and human achievements have a great value in the social standings with man. Amen. Amen. But they don't impress God, nor can they grant salvation. They don't impress God. You know, I got family go, well, you know, I go to Potter's house. That's a big church in Dallas, by the way. Famous pastor there. Okay. <laughs> you know? Or somebody tells me, you know, well, well I'm, I, I read in the Aramaic and the Greek and the Hebrew and all this kind of, Okay. But what does your life look like? Are you able to line up to the word? Just because you can speak the word don't mean you live in the word. Somebody needs to say something, right? Because you go to a big, nice, fancy church don't mean that the church is in you when you walk out the door and when you meet people and you come along situations. doesn't mean you're doing what the church is supposed to do. Amen. See, we want to put this, we put the dress on of, of Christianity, right? Without the life of it. Wow. Because you see, for Jesus tells us that we must deny ourselves if we want to be a true disciples. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26, he says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do y'all know when you say cross, it doesn't mean it's going to be a tickling match. It means there's going to be some suffering, right? And in verse 25, he says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? See, I'm talking about losing to gain this morning. And it's in verse 8D that Paul tells the Philippians he was willing to lose it all. He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Do you realize he's in prison right now while he's writing this? You got you to gotta keep that in the forefront of your mind. He's in prison, locked up because of the gospel. Got a guard chained to him with 24 inches of chain. 24-7, 365, plus one in the leap year. They didn't have that back then. But I want you to understand. Does this sound like a person that's in despair because he's in that situation? This is the book of joy. He's writing about all this joy that he has in the Lord and that he has for the Philippians, right? But he's telling them, here's the truth issue. Here's the truest message. Everything that I thought was something, worth something from a human perspective, was rubbish. I gave it all up so that I might gain Christ. Do you realize Paul, with clarity of view, places the temporal titles, positions, and possessions of this world, no matter how great they may see, seem to be in the eyes of man, into the trash? He didn't care what kind of horse they rode, camel or sandal they had on, or, or, or a robe they had on their back. You see, this includes his religious credentials and human achievements that I want you to realize. This is some very strong language from a man who once believed that these things would impress God and earn him salvation. 
Somebody say something. Do you see the change of heart here? He was counting on these things to get him into heaven. And now he gives some very strong language that they were nothing. In the original language, when it says rubbish, it says dung heap. That's where he believes they all belong, in the dung heap. But you see, there's always this but. And there's a big old but. When you come into the knowing knowledge of truth in Jesus Christ, everything fails in comparison. Everything. See, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. That's what I'm talking about. We're losing to gain this morning. This is the very reason why. Because it's in verse 9 that Paul tells the Philippians his desire was to be in Christ. Listen to what he says. And may be found in him. What is his goal? What is his strongest desire? To be found in him. So this is a very Pauline statement, by the way. Found in Christ. By the way, I found that he used it about 75 times in all the epistles that he's written. Found in him. So here it is. This is the one thing that he wanted more than breath itself was to be found in him. See, true believers, we are intertwined with Christ in an, an intimate life and love bond that is unbreakable. Somebody needs to say something. And so for Paul to describe his life, he described it this way in Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, I'm talking about losing to gain. This is how he said, I, this is who I am now. And you hear the last piece as to why he wanted to be so close to him? Who loved me and gave himself up for me. What greater love is there? You get it? So then if he loves us this way, then he would give his only life up for us, right? Then why does he get so little back from us? We betray him at every given turn because we want to please and be on some social strata with man and not him. Wow. And it's in verse 9b, Paul realized his righteousness of human works and religious credentials couldn't break the bondage of sin. Listen to what he says. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Paul is telling us that what he thought was his righteousness through the law based on human works, religious rituals, and external morality was really nothing but filthy rags. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. This is powerful stuff. See, because Paul tells the Galatians that if righteousness could be obtained by the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, where it says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, through the law, then Christ died needlessly. He died needlessly. So we know that not to be true, right? And so this is why I get excited, because he's writing this, and he doesn't know if I'm gonna, he's going to get out of this prison alive or die. But it doesn't shake his faith. It doesn't change how he sees it. It doesn't change what he's saying to the people. He speaks with even more conviction that he's inside of this prison. But you see, it's in verse 9, see that Paul tells the Philippians faith is the key. Do you realize that he couldn't see this, but he believed it? He said, but that which is through faith in Christ. Paul tells the Philippians that faith is the key to salvation, not human works, not circumcision of the flesh, but faith which is in Christ Jesus alone. Not faith in Patrick or anything else. You can see, here's the deal. Get your pens ready. I'm going to give you a definition and hope that you etch this in the hearts and minds. Sometimes you want a tattoo. Maybe this is the one you get. Faith is the confident, continuous confession of total dependence on and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
That is what it is. Faith is the confident, continuous confession of total dependence on and trust in Jesus Christ for the necessities, necessary requirements to enter God's kingdom. That's it. That's it. We like the Hebrews 11 version where it's, you know, right? But that one, you got to have that one, but this is really it. This is how you live out Hebrews 11, 1. See, it involves more than an intellectual agreement to the gospel, the truth of the gospel. See, there are a lot of people that will agree with you intellectually that the gospel is real and the gospel is true. A lot of folks sitting in church right now who will agree with you with the, from an intellectual perspective about the truth of the gospel. Saving faith includes trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and a surrender to his lordship. See, I'm talking about losing to gain this morning. For it's in verse 90 that Paul tells the Philippians that the righteousness he desires come from God. He says the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Isn't that beautiful? See, the righteousness that leads to salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. See, it was Paul who penned to the Corinthians these beautiful words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, where he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, it is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that washes the repentant sinner's sins away. Somebody needs to say something because here comes the miraculous part and then, it, it, then imputes Jesus' righteousness into their hearts. That's how we become sinless in this piece. This is how we become grafted in as children of God. By the imputed righteousness of Christ in our hearts. So if he does so much for us, why does he get so little back? Wow. And we think we've done something when we show up to church. We think we've done something. Or go to a Bible study. Or we read our daily bread. Or we think we've done something. This is what I love about being in this because it eats you up. Especially, I'll, I'll say it, it eats Patrick up. So when it starts to highlight all of the areas where mm, you could have done better there, mm, you know, right? And it's truth, not lie. God, God already knows. And so when y'all get this, y'all getting it for the first time. I've got it probably 15 times probably before it became here. But you see, I understand more so every single day that God gives me life and gives me breath what it means to lose to gain. See, it's in verse 10a that Paul goes on and tells us the third benefit he found in Christ was his power. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Do you see the things that he's desiring to know in God? He wasn't chasing money. He wasn't chasing fame. He wasn't chasing power. Do you understand? All the things that the average human breaks their neck over trying to go acquire. When Paul says that I may know him, he's speaking of a lifelong pursuit of an ever deeping, deeper knowledge of his Savior. It wasn't enough just to be saved. It wasn't enough just to be able to preach a message. It wasn't enough to be able to just do a Bible study. It wasn't enough just to be able to witness on the street. He wanted an ever-deepening, lifelong pursuit of knowledge of his Savior. And so Paul longed to experience the power of Jesus' resurrection. See, this was the greatest testament to his power over flesh and the spirit and over heaven and earth. Paul knew that there was no power in the law. He also knew that there was no power in the flesh to overcome sin. If you look at Romans chapter 7, verse 18, it says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. But all true believers in Christ, like Paul, has experienced Christ's resurrection power in two ways. Y'all get that? We've already experienced it in two ways. The first way, y'all ready for it? First, it was that same power that saved us. 
That's the first way you experienced it. It was that same power that saved us. If you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 7, it says this, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body might, a body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Verse seven, who is he, for he who has died is freed from sin. Somebody needs to say something because here comes the second one. It was the same power that sanctified us. Do y'all get that? Do you understand what it means to be sanctified? It means separated and set apart. You are sanctified and set apart from the world. Sanctified and set apart unto God. You are his. And if you're not experiencing that power right now in your life, maybe you got to ask yourself, do I truly belong to him? That is the issue. Because you see, the indwelling Holy Spirit does these things. It works with us to defeat temptation and trials. It helps us to lead holy lives and to boldly and fruitfully proclaim the gospel. Do you know what it means to boldly and fruitfully proclaim the gospel? Fruitfully means that your life doesn't cancel out the message that you've just boasted in. Fruitfully. And because your life don't cancel it out, you start to plant a seed, water, and also get to reap some of the harvest. That's what it means to be fruitfully. See, I'm talking about losing to gain this morning. And it's in verse 10b that Paul tells us that the fourth benefit in Christ, in Christ is fellowship. He says to fellowship of his, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Do y'all hear those words? The fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And so Paul is speaking of a, a deep partnership and communion with Christ in suffering. Do you realize that when Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus, his whole world changed? Paul didn't know suffering prior to the road to Damascus. Do y'all get that? He didn't know suffering. Not like this. Do y'all remember when, when, the, when, when Jesus sent Ananias to him to go say, I want you to go lay hands on my friend? Paul says that he is uh, praying and he has seen a man coming to lay hands on him, right? And Ananias says, but, but, but Lord, are you sure? This man has done horrible things to your people. He said, but, but you got to go and tell him the things that he must suffer for me, for my name's sake. Y'all get that? That's the word. You got to go tell him what he must suffer for my name's sake. See, we suffer as humans very rarely for his name's sake. Just call it what it is. You see, here's the thing. When Paul said that the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, he gained something when he got that. We all gain something when we get that. Y'all want to know what he gained? Christ. He gained a companion mm -hmm. to be with him in his sufferings to the very end. Somebody need to say something. Mm -hmm. He gained a companion to be with him to the very end in his sufferings. One who already knew and endured far more intense persecution and suffering than anyone else who've ever lived, all undeserved. The deepest moments of our spiritual fellowship with the living Christ are at times in the intense with our sufferings. As our sufferings come and it becomes intense, we know him better because it drives us to him. Suffering drives us to believers to the Lord. Of, we find Christ to be our merciful high priest. Somebody say something. See, a faithful friend who feels our pain. We always want somebody to commiserate with. He's a faithful friend that never turns his back, never says, oh my God, here we go again. Right? A sympathetic companion who understands 
what we are going through. The writer of Hebrews shares in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, these beautiful words. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Do you realize that he had to come in the flesh to understand our pain and suffering? He had to. If you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says this, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, which means the annihilation for the sins of the people. He had to. So therefore, he knows what it's like, Sean. He knows what it's like to be at the very bottom. and He knows what it's like to be at the very top. And he knows everything in between. He knows what it's like to lose somebody he loves. Come on now, I'm preaching to myself too today. He knows all these things. He knows our struggles. He knows our fears. He was made in this same flesh. See, I'm talking about losing the game this morning. But let's close this out. In verse 11, Paul now shares with us his fifth benefit in Christ. It was to know the glory of Christ. Listen to what he says. In order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul is speaking of the future bodily resurrection here. He's not speaking as if he's unsure of it. But he's speaking out of humility. Do y'all know Paul had an issue like us? You know, when you've done bad, you don't ever think God, I could ever be worth anything good. This comes from Paul's sense of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. It never left him. He even wrote about it. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 through 10. Listen to what he says. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. The least. The least of all the apostles. It not fit to be called an apostle. Not fit to be called an apostle. There's 13 books of the New Testament that holds his name. And this is how he sees himself before the Lord. Do y'all get this? I, because I persecuted the church of God. There is his sin. He never let himself go because of what he did. He fought against God and all that God was doing. And he continues to carry that as the millstone around his neck. That makes him feel unworthy. I fought against God. But there's a but, verse 10, big but. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. He's comparing himself to all the other apostles. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. You start to get a feeling of why he gave up everything to know God the way he did. He wanted to be the greatest vessel in God's army. And so therefore he gave up the things that would have held him to the world. That he may know him better. You see, all believers will attain to that resurrection at the rapture. All believers, true believers in the Lord will obtain to that resurrection at the rapture. When we will not all sleep, as the scripture says, somebody needs to say something. But we shall be changed in the twinkling in the moment of the eye, right? First Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 53 says this, but I tell you a mystery that we will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Verse 53, for the perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Somebody need to say something. See, I'm talking about losing to gain this morning. Paul is sharing that if we are willing to die to self and live for Christ, we will gain these same five incomparable benefits. An intimate knowledge of who Jesus is. 
we will gain the righteousness of Christ, we will gain the power of Christ, and we will gain the fellowship of Christ, and we will gain the glory of Christ. Somebody needs to say something. We're talking about losing to gain this morning. The word, the last few messages, the word has been fealty. Fealty is throughout this entire piece. There's no question to where Paul's faithfulness is. There's no question to where Paul's loyalty is. There's no question to where he's committed his whole life and everything to. No question. And he's writing this back to the body, the church. He's wanting them to know beyond all things, this is where you stay. This is where you focus. This is where you live. This is where you support. This is where you help. This is where you call right, right. This is where you call wrong, wrong in Christ. You see, when you detach yourself from the world, even though you have to live here, you're in the best position to speak on and call things what they really are because you don't have a vested personal interest. Y'all see that? You see, when we have a personal interest in something, we will overlook sin, we will overlook bad, we will overlook a whole bunch of stuff because we have a personal vested interest. See, that's the problem. But yet we want to lift up holy hands. But when we don't know holy like we should. Let us pray. Father, I thank you once again, Master, for a beautiful time in your word, Father. I pray that all that was shared here this morning was accepted on thy side. I thank you for those that pressed their way to be a part of this experience, Master. I, I pray for our online ministry, uh, uh, listeners and viewers as well. God, that you would just touch their hearts and minds. Allow this to find fertile soil for the seed to fall on and that it may plant itself deeply, Master. And that you may water it and then bring forth a bumper crop in their life of just reaching out and touching and being the things that we've called us to be, Father. God, we love you. I appreciate you. I thank you for even this day. And God, we just ask even now, Master, as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place, but never your sight, Father. Continue to go before us. Lead us and guide us. Keep us in perfect peace until we should come together again. And Father God, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer. And we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus' mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Stay safe. Continue to wear your mask. Wash your hands. Safe distancing. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care.